Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's Future in Space Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at deepastronomy.com, and we are bringing you, this is our monthly hangout that we do that help, that is uh, in, in cahoots with or, or with the uh, kind support of our endorsement of the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society, the two double ASs as we call them here, or double AS squared. And I should point out at the top of the, of the, of the broadcast that while we are, these hangouts are endorsed by the double ASs, the opinions and some of the content expressed in here isn't necessarily endorsed by them. So I uh, just wanted to point that out and kind of make that distinction. So let's, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Today, we are going to be talking about SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. I guarantee you, if you don't know what it is, you have never seen anything like this. This is an amazing mission that NASA is running out of uh, out of Ames, and we've got two guests here to tell us all about what the telescope is and what the observatory is and what it can do. And But let me, let me introduce my co-host uh, with me this month, or, as they are every month, Dr. Alberto Conti, the innovation astronomer extraordinaire at New North of Grumman. Hi, Alberto. It's good to see you again. Hi, Tony. It's good to see you again. Okay. Also joining me is Dr. Harley Thronson. He's an astronomer at the Goddard Space Flight Center. He helps wrangle all of our guests and get our topics put together. Hi, Harley. Yeah, good afternoon. No extraordinaire. Oh yes, he is our he is our wrangler. How about wrangler? Wrangler extraordinaire. Is that better? Okay. There are no words to describe you, Harley. We are hard. Right. You are definitely well, one. Not in a family show, anyway. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so uh, while I've got Harley up, I'd like for him to uh, he's going to give us a real summary about what today's topic is going to be about. Go ahead, Harley. Yeah, right. I think I think the audience is going to find this. Well, I hope uh, I hope all of our future in space. Um, uh, hangouts have been very exciting. This one, I think, will be particularly interesting, and I have a, a personal link to it as well. Um, most folks know or think of um, NASA uh, astronomy as some of our uh, most exciting and important missions, the Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, future missions um, such as that into space. The reason we go into space is we get a much less obscured um, view of the target object. But this can be very expensive and very time consuming. Um, almost, I think actually it was more than half a century ago, um, astronomers, engineers, and so on began to argue that um, instead of the time and expense of going all the way into space, what about high flying platforms in the Earth's atmosphere? Balloons, which we have coming up in a future um, hangout, but why not aircraft? And with increasing sophistication, astronomers and engineers and technologists and managers have been putting increasingly large aperture telescopes um, into a, a series of high flying jet aircraft, culminating in what we're going to hear about today the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And we have two um, long standing excellent practitioners of this uh, remarkable um, area of astrophysical research, uh, Bill and Tom. Uh, quick note I've known Bill and Tom for many years. In fact, I did my um, thesis uh, on the predecessor. Uh, to Sophia, the predecessor to the Stratosphere Observatory. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yep, yep, the Kuiper Observatory, which I think Tom and Bill, I don't know if you were involved in in, in the Kuiper Observatory. I know uh, uh, Tom was, and, I, and that's where he and I oh, met um, on right. the tarmac at the uh, Ames Research Center, I think more than a few nights. In any case, so we've got a very, um, I think, two um, experts on this interesting aircraft, and I think Okay. Tony, I'll hand it back to you to introduce. Cool. Excellent. Yep. Let me, I will introduce our guests here in just a minute, both of whom are from the NASA Ames Research Center. But I want to, this is a hangout. I have to tell you real quick, we're switching things up a little bit. Uh, new way for you to interact with us. If you have guests, your questions or comments for our guests, go to deepastronomy.com slash live, where I have a chat client set up. You can go there and I am monitoring that chat now and I'm seeing a lot of you already joining. It's good to see Galaxia again, as well as a few other people that are there. So thank you guys for uh, using that. We're also using our future in space hashtag on Twitter like we always are as well. So you can interact in those two ways if you have questions for our guests. So let's get started. Okay, so joining me, and I'm going to just go from uh, right to left in my window as you guys were appearing, uh, Dr. William Reach, he's the uh, he's a Sophia scientist. At, both of these guys, by the way, are from the NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, hi, William. Welcome to our hangout. It's good to see you. Hey there. Uh, go ahead and call me Bill so I recognize Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Okay. You, have, you had it on your lower third. I was reading it that way. Okay, yeah. Bill. Thanks. And I was calling you Bill the whole time, too. Yeah. And also joining me is uh, 
is uh, Dr. Tom. Uh, oh my gosh, I just forgot how to at, pronounce your last name. Is it Rolling? Yeah, it is Rolig, yes. Ro Rolig, okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tom Rolig, he is also at NASA, NASA Ames. And you, uh, what's your title there? Uh, I'm the uh, Deputy Project Scientist uh, for SOFIA. Uh, SOFIA is just one of a number of projects I'm involved with, although I spend most of my time on SOFIA compared to, uh, for example, I also work on the James Webb Space Telescope and yep. a few other ones. But uh, most of the time these days, it's on SOFIA. Great. Okay. Well, let's get started. I would like let's. So while I have you up here, Tom, I'm going to put up this picture of what Sophia looks like, and then I'd like you to give us just a a brief overview of what is this thing. What is Sophia? Well, Sophia is the latest of the uh, stream of of uh, airborne observatories that NASA has developed. It started off with a uh, a few instruments and a Convair 990 aircraft and. Then we moved on to a small telescope and a Learjet executive uh, jet that uh, NASA had. Uh, then it went on to a modified um, cargo aircraft, um, a uh, Lockheed Martin C-141 cargo aircraft with a telescope with a 36-inch mirror in it. And that flew for quite a number of years out of NASA Ames here. But eventually that was also retired. Uh, actually, if I look out my office window right now, I can see its tail sticking up as it <laughs> well, it sits out in the, uh, in the field here, uh, rotting away. Um, but now we've got a brand new and much bigger aircraft. This is a, a Boeing 747 special purpose aircraft. It was a plane that um, Boeing built to uh, fly higher, faster, and longer than the standard 747s, which is exactly what we want. And it's got a much bigger telescope in it. Its uh, telescope mirror is 2.7 meters in diameter, and uh, it observes while we're actually flying uh, high in the uh, in the air. Um, and uh, there's what you're seeing now is a picture of the aircraft at night, uh, and the door is actually open. Normally, it's not open on the ground like this, but it is in this picture. With the inset there shows the primary mirror and the secondary, uh, and uh, of the of the telescope itself. So this is a, a an airplane with a giant telescope <laughs> poking out the side of it, uh, and you got what? So with with the um, and apparently this is something that um, you've upgraded over the over the period over a period of of its mission. Um, so Bill, let me ask you: What are some of the uh, what what's the main um, sort of science objectives of this observatory? Well, the the main science objectives are. Uh, generally infrared astronomy, which means studying the, uh, the infrared emission that comes from stars, planets, galaxies, uh, and in particular, the part that doesn't make it down all the way to the ground, where we could observe it with, uh, with ground-based observatories. Uh, so we, put, we make a telescope that's, uh, that can reflect the light and detectors and cameras and spectroscopes uh, that can analyze it. And, and yeah, that's really the main goal. In fact, okay. you could probably go to that uh, transmission picture. <laughs> okay, good, yes, because um, the, the, I, wanna, I wanna bear down on this just a little bit. You're, this is an infrared observatory, and we've yes. talked about on other hangouts before and in many other areas, the, the infrared is very difficult to observe at certain wavelengths with, because of the atmosphere. Uh, things like water vapor and other things in the atmosphere absorb infrared at key wavelengths. And so to be able to, that's why a lot of space telescopes are now infrared telescopes because they don't have to worry about the atmosphere. And so there is this, um, let me pull this up here real quick while I'm talking. Um, this one? Yes, yeah, here we thanks. go. Yeah, so here's a, so why, yeah, go ahead and talk about this a little bit. Yeah, thanks. This one really does explain uh, why why we make Sophia. Um, uh, so what you see on the horizontally is wavelengths. So that's the color the color of light, and it, and goes, it goes all the way. This is in microns, so between one and a thousand microns. So definitely the infrared. Yeah. So visible light is at the left hand side, uh, the shortest wavelengths in this picture, and then. Uh, a thousand microns on the right hand side is a millimeter and in the middle is what we call infrared. So uh, the places, if you look at the top, the top half of this picture, the places where it's all colored in blue are, uh, that shows how much is being absorbed by the atmosphere. And Mauna Kea, I should just point out, is one of the best infrared sites on the planet. So you could still, uh, there's still a lot Mauna Kea can't see. Yeah, the only two that I know that are better are there's there's a site in Chile that's very good, and right. at the South Pole. 
Um, so you can get a little better than Mauna Kea, but still, yes, you can see at wavelengths around 30 through 300 microns, which is uh, which is part of our, our wheelhouse for Sophia. The transmission is zero from the ground, and that remains That's over here true. in this region here. Right oh, yeah, you can see where you're pointing. Yes, yeah, good. Right. Um, so that remains true even from the South Pole. It's, it's, uh, it's obscured even from there. If, however, we can take the telescope above the layer of clouds, so above the tropopause in the Earth's atmosphere and into the stratosphere, which is where commercial aircraft do generally just barely make into, uh, then the transmission is much better. So the bottom panel shows what the atmospheric transmission is from Sophia. And now you can see it's still messy. It's not, uh, it, the transmission is not 1.0, which would be 100% in this figure. Uh, but it becomes significant. You can actually see in between, um, in between the places that are opaque at, sp at, uh, at most wavelengths. So we average better than 80% transmission over the far infrared wavelengths. Right, and I like the spirit of the way you've done this because here you can see at the top panel, there's a lot of blue. It's blocking out a lot of this galaxy behind it, and so and Sophia below in the bottom panel can let you see more. Now, this doesn't mean that you're actually blocking out part of the galaxy because if you image the galaxy, let's say right here, you would still see the entire galaxy. It's just that it would be at this particular wavelength. So it just, but it's a good way to illustrate that you do see more of something at different wavelengths. Uh, using Sophia and getting out above the atmosphere. So this is really cool. So the operational latitude, while we're ha while I have this up, you guys work between about 39,000 and 45,000 feet. And that's only slightly more than a than a normal passenger aircraft. I guess if you listen to the to the pilot or if you put up the GPS thing while you're on a on a uh, uh, a long flight, they do get up to up to about 39,000 feet. Uh, but we go a, we go a little higher. That's why, as Tom mentioned, we have the SP version of the 747. Uh, it's a little shorter than a seven, than than most 747s, and we have uh, we push the engines very hard to get them up as high as we possibly can. Because once every thousand feet additional that we go higher does improve our view of the sky. This little blue part gets a little bit less each time. What exactly. is this big deep line here in the center that doesn't go away no matter what? Is that water vapor right there? It's actually no. carbon dioxide. Yeah, that's, that's carbon dioxide. Oh, okay. So this is what, so just so you can maybe get an intuitive feel for this, the blue stuff indicates that infrared cannot get through at that part, in that part. And this is what it's due to. In this case, it's due to uh, CO2. In other cases, it might be due to water vapor in the in the atmosphere, which blocks the you know, ultraviolet light at those uh, wavelengths. So this is kind of a graph of transmission, as 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 it says here on the right. So I just wanted to kind of maybe give another uh, wording to what uh, what Bill was saying. So anyway, this is this is where it looks and the kind of improvement you get at Mauna Kea. Um, I want to I want to uh, maybe I could get uh, Tom you to comment on this <laughs> tell us a little bit about how you use this telescope okay could you go back one slide first though yeah uh we, this is this is actually the back of the telescope this is inside the aircraft and so i the first picture showed you a view from the outside but this is actually um with the if you're looking towards the tail of the aircraft from the main deck this is what you see that big blue area is the back end of the telescope. Right uh, the silver uh, circular area right there is indicates where the science instruments would mount. Mm -hmm. There is a pressure bulkhead there, that big gray area, that actually allows, even though that door is open in flight be aft of this, where the scientists are all working, it's a very, basically a shirt sleeve environment. We don't have to be in pressure suits or wear oxygen masks. Uh, and that pressure bulkhead allows us to do that, even though that telescope is moving all the time as we're flying. So right now, on the side of the airplane, there's this big door that's open to uh, the sky, and you're protected from that by this door here and these and this seal. That seal, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if actually in flight, that all that blue area there is jiggling and moving around all the time, and uh, that's it looks like, like slowing and rotating like this. It's rotating. It's swinging back and forth. It's. Uh, it's. Uh, I don't have a movie to show, but if you did, it could. I, I do have movies, but you'd actually see it moving. On the other hand, if you go up and set a cup of coffee on it, you'd see the coffee is perfectly still, 
And in fact, it's the aircraft that's moving around. But we have to keep that telescope moving to keep it locked on to the same right. position in the sky all the time. Yeah, I want to come back to the pointing and how you do that in just a minute. But, I, but before, I want to get more basic before I do that. And that is... Sure. So the, let's go on to the next slide then. Okay. And this is looking in the other direction. Well, actually looking in the same direction, but further on back. And you right, can, you can see the blue back here. Exactly. Yeah. And you can see there's, these are, the, on a typical flight, you have quite apart from the cockpit crew of the, um, generally consists of four people, a pilot, co-pilot, a flight engineer, and a navigator. Uh, there is, uh, the people down here are all either controlling the telescope, uh, directing the mission, or um, operating the science instruments that are back end of the telescope. And everyone's got all sorts, you can see there's all sorts of monitors and things. The screens that are up in the upper left are actually the telescope operators. Those are, they are actually the ones that are controlling where the telescope is pointing, keeping it locked into position. And uh, the person in the um, uh, lower right is in the, that's in the mission director's area. <clears throat> I always look at the mission director as like the conductor on the train. He actually, he or she, we, both men and women, we have as mission directors, um, actually run the observing flight and, uh, and in the same way that they're the conductor on the train, the uh, pilots are the engineers on the train, and the, uh, the, the scientists are more than passengers. They're very active passengers, but they run their scientific instruments. Okay, so the, um, with, what was, so that's how you use it. That's what the control room looks like. That's what the, uh, the telescope itself is looking like. Describe for me a typical. How does how do astronomers get time? Is it is this something that you have to apply to get time for? Uh, how do you decide what you're going to go look at? And uh, are are there more than one observing programs kind of lumped into one? Give us a sense of what an observing run might entail, how it's decided, and then maybe how long you stay up. Um, who would be better for that? Would that be would that be you, Bill? Yeah, sure. I'll take care of that. So, so at the at the science center, we do. Uh, we do accept proposals, and we do it on an annual basis. We uh, we ask people to write four-page proposals explaining what they want to do with the observatory, how long it will take, um, and what they're going to get out of it. And then we invite a panel of our, of our peers, of scientific experts in the disciplines that we expect to be applying. We invite them to come and evaluate the proposals. So. Uh, a large fraction of the ones that are submitted don't get accepted. So there is quite a bit of competition to get the time. <laughs> Just like on Hubble, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, so then after we've selected them, uh, we take all of all of the observations that people have proposed and that are highly regarded by our allocation committees. We take them and we put them in a in a heap and we try to schedule them throughout the year. The scheduling process on Sophia is is a bit complicated because general we only have one science instrument on the telescope at a time and usually there's guest investigators want to use want to use one instrument but we have to we have to schedule each of their observations at a time when the right instrument is on the telescope and when the thing that they want to look at in the sky because we only observe at night uh, when that's up and available so really is that really a consideration because what it would seem to me like one of the advantages of having a telescope like yours that can fly anywhere it needs to go would be that you're at you're at a better advantage than say a ground-based telescope that has to wait for the southern constellations for example to be up in the sky before they can observe it sophia has similar limitations then is what you're saying you can't you probably presumably can't just travel anywhere in the world on a whim uh to see something that might not be up in the united states for example well, even if you did, the sky is still, uh, even at, at many infrared wavelengths, and certainly at all at, at visible light wavelengths, where we which we use to guide the telescope, the sky is very bright in the daytime. It seems like an obvious statement, but uh, but it's true. O operating in the daytime is much. More no, no, difficult. no. I meant. I guess I meant whatever's up at night. Uh, you know, you're not geographically bound. So yeah, I get that you can't observe during the day, but. The, the point I'm trying to make, though, is you're not geographically bound by what you've got to observe, for, for example. You see what I'm saying? Well, there's, it implies a, a geographic limitation because pretty much the same things up at night anywhere in the world. Uh, in terms of eventually during the year, everything does come up that's in the north if you're in the north and then the south if you're in the south. So we have to balance that. We do take the observatory to the southern hemisphere every year uh, in order to get 
some southern hemisphere targets. We usually do it for a focused campaign of, of uh, a little more than a month. So the things that are up during our southern month, we can observe from the south. But um, there, there is a link. There is a geographic and temporal constraint there that we can't, we can't, you can't just go anywhere to see anything at any given time because about half the time it's behind the sun, and we can't see it. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah and I then understand about, that part. But and I, then we have our operating base. Location. I was just wondering if you, if it freed you up any uh, from maybe north and south, north and south hemisphere or anything like that. But uh, what is the? So give us a little bit about what is the range of this telescope? How long do you typically stay up? Right. And can you maybe stay up longer by doing any refueling in the air, or is that even mm -hmm. not even necessary? Um, I'm not going to touch the airborne uh, refueling. That sounds uh, that sounds dangerous. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can do it. We can do it with, with autonomous vehicles. Come on, it's not that dangerous. Yeah. Okay. I'd rather do it with autonomous yeah, than to, with me on. Just, yeah, come out to Goddard, Bill, and we'll introduce you to Frank Cipollina. There yeah. you go. Exactly. <laughs> and it would take an awful lot of fuel in there as well. At uh, cruise altitude, those 747 engines uh, burn yeah. 12 tons of fuel an hour. So, oh, yeah. man, that's not good gas mileage. So what, what is your typical run? So how long are you up? Uh, about 10 hours at a, at, at, from uh, the takeoff to landing. So we don't want to see your carbon footprint. Maybe eight and a half hours we're doing uh, scientific observations. Okay, and so you, I like this. I like what you pointed out about the some of the instruments. You could switch them out depending on what you want to study at the time. Give us an idea of the kinds of different instruments that you have on board, and, and are you know are they primarily cameras and and what are the I don't know. Just tell us what what kind of instruments you have. Uh, Tom, you want to do that one? Sure. Yeah, we actually have quite a suite of instruments that we can swap out, and they uh, range in wavelength from. Uh, Basically, we even have a visible light in instrument uh, that we can put on there that we use for occultations that we'll be talking about later. Um, but the uh, and they go in wavelength all the way out to basically a millimeter or very close to it. The uh, there are, some of them are cameras. Uh, they take images of the sky with different filters so that you can actually get the different infrared wavelengths. Uh, there's also quite a number of spectrometers. The spectrometers can either use diffraction gratings to split up the light into different colors and detect them in the different colors. Or they can be basically radio receivers that operate at very, very high frequencies, not in the radio, but in the infrared, in the far infrared, and <clears throat> but operate with the same sort of uh, uh, technology that you would use for your, uh, your, your AM radio. So um, depending on the science that uh, is proposed uh, we and what the objects are, we put together flight campaigns, typically of about two or three weeks in duration for each instrument, and then go fly flights during that time. You generally fly about uh, three or four flights a week when we're flying, and uh, then and get the science done with that particular instrument for that suite of observers. Okay, so just to make sure I've got the, the workflow down, and Alberto, I know you want to ask your question. I'll no, get to you in just okay. a second. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, so you have it. You have you have people proposing from all over the world to use Sophia. The time allocation committee sits down. They look at all these proposals and they say yes, this one's good. Most of them don't because it's so competitive. It, you got to have make a really really good science case to use this instrument. Those who succeed, then presumably you guys will group these together because you've already got a schedule. Is that right for the? For the instruments that are going to be installed, this is the time when this one's going to be installed on the aircraft. This is the time when the the cameras and, and whatever different uh, uh, instruments you want to put on are put on there, and then you group the observing proposals around. And you say this is when you're going to have an observing time. Do I have that more or less right? That's basically right. Although actually, the uh, when we put the instruments on is again driven by. Everything's driven by science. Okay, so you, so if you get a lot of proposals for a certain kind of thing that might warrant a certain instrument to be on longer, you'll do exactly. That. Yeah, there are some instruments that are much more popular than others, and so those with the pop, the ones that win the popularity contest get to. Uh, go to the <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Alberto, you had a good question on on the on the on the. Well, actually, I didn't want to ask that. I want to ask you some other question actually because uh, oh. so the. Uh, Something similar that came up right now. Something, uh, another question. So, I'm assuming you cannot swap instruments during flight, right? Right. That is correct. Yeah, they are very. I mean, these are they weigh um, many, 
many, many hundreds of kilograms. They're, That's they're what I thought. So it's not like you're going to do it. Uh, plus, you don't have, I mean, you don't have the whole night. You have, uh, you know, seven, eight, seven hours of observation. So, so you don't right. want to do that. You don't want to, okay. So, yeah, the question I had is, you know, I come from a background of uh, infrared astronomy. Northrop Grumman is building James Webb Space Telescope. It's an infrared telescope. It operates at a very low temperature, 40 Kelvin, you know. So, your, Sophia is also an infrared telescope. So, is it cooled? Does he operate at what temp? What's the operating temperature of the telescope? Well, the telescope. Unfortunately, we cannot cool the optics of the telescope to anything colder than the um, what we call the recovery temperature of the cavity that it's in, which is a little bit warmer than the stratosphere. So that you know, by <clears throat> our terrestrial standards, that's still pretty cold. It's maybe right. you know minus forty to fifty degrees centigrade. Um, on the other hand, it is um, nowhere near as cold as James Webb and certainly nowhere near as cold as the Spitzer Space Telescope, which was cooled by uh, superfluid uh, liquid helium. But um, we quit, if, if we did, even at that, those thin altitudes, there's still enough water vapor there. If we were trying to cool the telescope any colder than the outside air temperature, we'd just wind up with a uh, frost layer on all the optics. Right. And so that basically has a net effect of a basic increase in your background. So the... Exactly. Uh, right? That's, that's uh, exactly... Okay, I see, I see. All right, great. Well, I'm seeing a lot of you guys on the chat window. That's really cool. Thanks for using the live chat thing. I'll get to a lot of your uh, questions here in just a minute because uh, you've got some good ones going there. But uh, I want to talk a little bit now about the um, the kinds of science that Sophia is uniquely positioned to do. And maybe, um, maybe, Bill, I can get you to comment on this. What are some things that Sophia brings to the infrared astronomy science table that other observatories might struggle with? So there's a number of physical processes that are especially uh, capable of making infrared radiation. Those are the ones uh, those are the ones that become relatively unique to Sophia. Molecules, when they vibrate, they emit uh, light that's characteristically in the infrared. And when molecules rotate, that emission, the, the light that they make, uh, tends to come out at the far infrared and submillimeter and millimeter wavelengths. So we can see the characteristic emission of gases, uh, mostly molecular, but also ions, at far infrared wavelengths. So that's one of the specialties. And then the other one is solid material in interstellar space, which we generally call dust. Uh, interstellar dust. Oh, yeah, cool. I can use this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, interstellar dust also emits in the infrared wavelengths anything, any solid body that's uh, that has a has a temperature, well has a temperature, um, will emit radiation and uh, and infrared wavelengths cover a wide range of the temperatures that occur naturally in space. And of course here, here um, here on Earth we're at about uh, 270 or so degrees Kelvin. We emit uh, we emit infrared radiation around. Uh, 10 microns. Actually, that's our peak emission of of our bodies and and the Earth. So other so really planetary a 10 systems, micron telescope then. A 10 micron a telescope that works at 10 microns will be good for studying things at about our temperature. Okay. If you go further away from stars uh, into interstellar space, so interstellar meaning between the stars. If you go into interstellar space or or young star forming regions or dark clouds, then everything gets colder. And that emission, as you can imagine, it goes to uh, longer wavelength because the, uh, when things are colder, they emit more red, if you probably remember. So when you go out to 100 microns, you can study things that are 10 times colder. Um, so let's see, for the science themes that you put up there, thank you. There is one that says galaxies in the galactic center. Um, so we can study the solid particles and the gas from galaxies, both of the things that I just talked about. That includes, uh, and then on the right it says interstellar medium of the Milky Way. That's actually a picture of a of a supernova remnant, but clouds of gas and dust glowing uh, in the space in between the stars. In this case, it's uh, it's material that's been shocked and excited uh, by an explosion uh, of of a star, uh, but also just uh, the clouds of gas and dust that are heated, uh, as besides being shocked by stars. You can see that in interstellar space, and we can study, we can learn from that uh, the conditions of the material from which future generations of stars form. All right. Well, and so th these are really great things to be studying, no question about it. But to me, I want to get into something because this is an airplane and it moves around. <laughs> You're able to do something called 
uh, occultation astronomy, and I'd like to talk about that just a little bit. Let me pull, let me pull this back up again. Oh shoot, my. Uh, I have it. You got it. You got it. Yeah, I'll pull it up. Go yeah. ahead and pull it up for me, Alberto. Would you? And um, I don't know either. Either either Bill or Tom, you can talk about what, about the, what this is. But occultation astronomy is something that um, I think nobody else can really do as well as Sophia, right? That's right. That's uh, here right. it is. <laughs> And, uh, actually, First, I'll, tell us I'll, what it is, and then how Sophia does it. Yeah, let me let me take that. Since uh, about a year ago at this time, I was actually on a flight uh, doing that, where we were looking at Pluto. Um, the uh, what happens with the uh, with occultation is that as solar system objects uh, move around, occasionally they will pass in front of uh, the light from a star. And when that happens, they cast their shadow on the Earth. And if we actually can measure the star as it winks out behind the, the, uh, the object, you can get a, a, a number of uh, different pieces of unique information. For one thing, uh, you can get a handle on the size of the object. And just you do that just by timing how long that uh, shadow is as it, uh, as it passes in front of the star. And as well as if there's any sort of atmosphere around that object, you can also, as the as the uh, you're looking basically at the sunrise and sunset, or star rise and sun or star set through the atmosphere of that that uh, that object, you can actually then get information about the the atmosphere itself. And a year ago, we did uh, when back when we were in Christchurch, New Zealand, there was an occultation of Pluto. Uh, that we observed from there. Now, why did we go down to New Zealand to do it? Turns out that these occultations, these little shadows that are cast on the surface of the Earth, are uh, depend on the size of the object. So when we have a total uh, solar eclipse, for example, where we get the shadow of the moon under the Earth, it does not uh, cover the whole Earth or anything close to it, but it's still a biggish area of, uh, of shadow. When you've got something like Pluto, which is much smaller than our moon, and also is much further away, the shadow gets uh, is, is very much smaller. And so there's only a very small area of the Earth that actually is, is uh, in shadow when this transit happens. Okay, that's great if you've got a telescope there, but mostly you don't. That's right. <laughs> so what you can do instead is take our airborne observatory, which can fly anywhere in the world, and make sure that we are in the right time, at the right space on the Earth. And you know what? We're also guaranteed perfectly clear weather. We don't have to worry about clouds either. And so we can actually make get these occultation measurements. And this is a the best tool that we the, the world has right now for making occultation measurements is the SOFIA Observatory. So I just want to go back real fast and just real briefly, just in case you missed that, an occultation, all it is, is when something moves and something else. Uh, and, and you can measure the a lot of things depending on what, what the motion is. But the most dramatic occultation would be a solar eclipse. Another really dramatic one is a lunar eclipse. And what, um, what Bill is talking about, I mean, what Tom is talking about here is uh, using Pluto as it passes in front of a star to, uh, to get information uh, about the, uh, the, some of the properties of Pluto. And you can do things that you can time how long it takes for a uh, background object to pass in front of it. That's a good way to get a precise idea of how big something is. Uh, as well as, as, as also he, Tom was mentioning, if you go and look at starlight as it passes through an atmosphere, you can get some sense of what that atmosphere is made of. And that's something that JWST will be doing a lot of as well with uh, with exoplanets. So um, so great. So this is, this is like a real strength, it seems to me, for what what Sophia can do, but I, I just kind of, how do you, what makes a good occultation? Like what what are give me an example? You, you mentioned Pluto. Give me another example of what really great science can be done from occultation astronomy. Well, let me just I'll I'll go back to uh, Pluto actually for occultation okay. because um, this was actually the occultation occurred shortly before the New Horizon spacecraft. Well, well describe the occultation of Pluto and what? what? What what was traveling behind it? Just a star? It was just a star. The Pluto okay. was passing in front of a star. It was a reasonably bright star, which is good because the brighter the star, the uh, better the signal and noise that you get. The more information you can get, right. And, and one of the things that we are very curious about with Pluto, Pluto does have an atmosphere, but it also has a very highly eccentric orbit. 
so that it does not, you know, its, it's distance from the sun varies quite strongly as it goes throughout a Pluto mm -hmm. year, which is, of course, much longer than one of our years. <clears throat> anyway, that um, the, at some point it is expected that the Pluto atmosphere will, in fact, condense out and collapse. And we were very curious to see at this time, this is right about the time when we were expecting that to happen. In fact, we found that it did not do that. And um, also, it also showed the New Horizons spacecraft that it was transparent enough still that they were going to be able to get good images by the time they got there a couple, three weeks later. Nice. <laughs> so anyway, it was a uh, it was very clean, uh, very clean occultation. If you can get right in the center of the um, of the shadow, you can actually get refraction through the atmosphere all the way around the atmosphere, and that gets you uh, even more information about uh, rather than if you were just going if you uh, were not quite quite in the center of that of that uh, um, that shadow. And it turns out <clears throat> Sophia had to do some real-time gyrations in flight just to in fact catch that beginning that that uh, center of the shadow but we nailed it within just a few kilometers and so our data for that was particularly good well, nice very good well while we're on the I've, i see a lot of your questions and comments and i'm going to read them out but this one is particularly relevant to uh, what tom just said andrew planet is asking um uh can an occultation by solar system bodies be used to find exoplanets um, well, certainly that's exactly not within our solar system uh, uh, bodies. We can find, there's a couple ways that you can do exoplanets. Uh, of course, the main one that everyone thinks of these days are with uh, a, um, using a, um, a Kepler mission does, a, a, a transit of another star by an exoplanet. You just look at a lot of different stars and you look at the dimming of a, of a star when a pa planet passes in front of it. Another way you can do that get the information is using a technique called gravitational lensing. And that is where you have a free-floating planet or a brown dwarf or something small actually pass in front of a, a um, star in the background and not just block out the light, but actually, in fact, due to Einstein's uh, general law of general relativity, you can use that object as a lens and it actually makes the star light brighten. Yeah. And with that, that's a good way of detecting exoplanets that are uh, not close to other planets that might even be free-floating exoplanets, so, if you like. So in the spirit of this question, though, I don't think you can position Sophia in an occultation form that sort of makes this lensing happen. Could no, that, yeah. we don't know where those, that's going to happen. You pretty much have to look at the, uh, just so the large areas of the sky like NASA's W first mission is going to be doing in the uh, upcoming uh, decade. That's right. We've talked about W first in past ones. Okay, cool. So I want to get a little bit uh, to, to, I'm running out of time, but before I get to the questions and comments, I want maybe Bill, you could talk a little bit about some of the, what are some of the highlights of the SOFIA mission as far as the discoveries that you guys are maybe, I, mean, I know you're proud of all of your discoveries, but what, <laughs> something, could you put, could you pick some maybe that stand out in your mind? Some of the things that Sophia has either helped, helped settle a question to or discovered, or you're particularly proud of the science. So um, one example, just going back to Pluto, because we already started talking about it, uh, is in the atmosphere of Pluto. By seeing that the brightness doesn't change abruptly when the planet goes in front of the star, but in fact gradually fades. Uh, we can measure, th we measured the properties of the atmosphere, and when we first observed an occultation, that was a few years ago with, with Sophia, the analysis of the results said um, that they didn't make sense for a clear, a clear atmosphere, and instead there had to be a particle haze. There had to be small solid particles in the atmosphere of Pluto. And that was certainly a controversial result, and then in the uh, observation that was done last year, they found the same result, perhaps even more, well, much more convincingly. And this was right before the New Horizons uh, spacecraft flew by. And then in those spacecraft images, they actually imaged the haze layers due to particles around Pluto in great detail. So it was an example of something that we could find. We actually can say things about that haze layer that wasn't even possible from the spacecraft mission. Uh, because because of our ability to measure different colors in infrared light. So that's one. Very proud of that one. I stuck a picture of the haze over on the uh, chat window that people can look at if they want to. Okay. 
Um, oh, good. Yes, I see yeah. it. Yes, there it yeah. is. There's a URL there. So copy and paste that. So good. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, imaging the galactic center. So uh, we we got the best image uh, to date of the uh, of the dust particles that are in a ring that's surrounding the the middle of our galaxy. There's a, a very massive black hole. Uh, I think the current estimate is in the few hundreds of thousands of uh, times the mass of the sun. Black hole in the middle of our galaxy. We measured the uh, temperature and distribution of dust around in that uh, circumnuclear ring around the uh, galactic center black hole. So that was uh, that was a paper we were excited I about. I have it up now. Is this the image you're talking about? Uh, yes, thanks. Oh, cool. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so there you can see there's uh, there, let's see, a, a ring. Um, that's uh, it's oriented at about uh, 11 o'clock if you give a, an orientation and then there's sort of a yellow dove shaped uh, uh, cloud of dust and that's actually material that might be falling inward to uh, to the central black hole which is near the middle of the ring here. Um, here. yeah sir I'm waving my hands but I know you're not seeing that yes <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so there we're seeing uh, we're seeing into the into the heart of the uh, the galactic center. And one thing to point out is that this that kind of thing is completely invisible uh, to visible light. You you can't see the middle of our galaxy in visible light. And that's this is really a beautiful picture. This is amazing. I, this, yeah, the, yeah. I've never seen anything like that. That's really cool. So all right, well the, we are getting uh, we're getting to the point where I, we have a question here from um, oh I moved my my uh, my plot, but this one is. Um, uh, from George Caldwell. Welcome back, George. It's good to see you again. He's asking a question that I'm going to add to in a minute. How expensive are the most popular instruments, and what sort of instruments are the most expensive? And and when you talk about that, could you also talk a little bit about the mission itself, the lifetime of the mission, and how long you're expected to operate? I don't, I don't know which one. Would that be for you, Tom? Well, I can certainly answer that because okay. we actually just solicited and selected the development of a new instrument for Sophia. And uh, the call for proposals suggested that the, uh, the budgets for the development of that instrument would be about $17 million. So that's the cost. And that's a, that's a good new with a complicated instrument. That's about what they, the ones that we would want, that's about what they cost. Uh, <clears throat> once we've got them on board, of course, they'll be lasting for many years. The SOFIA program itself, uh, assuming that uh, NASA and Congress are still willing to con uh, continue to fund it, find that, and the science community uh, finds the, the, uh, the, the science compelling, um, the, all of our hardware, all of our spare parts and everything are designed to last for a 20-year operational lifetime. And uh, if we go beyond there, that's fine, but at least we've, we've sized everything for that for, to at least be able to go that far. So twenty, another. So you've got at least that long. So that's good. What about the uh, 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 the um, how long have you already been up? I don't think we've talked about that yet. Well, actually, it's we've gradually brought Sophia online. We wanted to start doing Sophia science uh, as early as possible, and so we've been doing some science for basically the past five years or so. Um, but the way that we've done it is that um, we've started doing science even when we quite hadn't finished developing Sophia. Uh, particularly, we haven't finished developing all of our instruments yet. Um, in addition to the new one, we're just selecting some of the old ones that are in development. We've still got one more instrument to go. It's been on the plane already. Uh, it's going through shakedowns right now. But um, uh, so it's, it's, we've been doing, started off by doing just a little bit of science and doing a lot of development, and now we're mostly doing science, but just finishing up a little bit of the development of the observatory and its instruments. Okay, well, I have a question about the airplane itself, the aircraft that you fly this on. Obviously, a lot of modifications have been done to accommodate the instrumentation on board. Um, is, there any, is there any need, do you think, that you would need to maybe do any upgrades to the aircraft itself for any of these future plans that you have, or is the platform pretty much going to be set for the next 20 years or so? The aircraft itself is probably not going to be modified uh, at all. Uh, what we put inside it, not just the instruments, but um, there's other aspects. For example, in our more modern and cool, the innards of these infrared instruments. Are uh oh, he's getting. I think we lost him. Yeah, he's getting a little. Yeah. Temperature. 
We're losing you, Thomas. So we're gonna better refrigerators to cool the innards of those instruments in the just inside of that plane. There's other things that we're putting in on board. We recently put in the ability for about internet absolute zero activity through um, as a fray about their own uh, hardware system uh, as we're flying along. Um, <clears throat> so there, that that sort of work will be um, will continue on doing that. But the aircraft itself, I don't. Um, we'll still have to do maintenance. But what we've uh, but other than that, we're probably not going to do anything more than what we've already done. Okay, we lost you on some of that, but I basically got the idea is that the airplane is pretty much the the way you need it to be. But I, I want to ask you about the pointing, though, because a ground-based telescope design is pretty straightforward in terms, I don't think it's changed much in terms of what it has to do. It just has to compensate for the rotation of the Earth to keep things precisely pointed in the field of view. What challenges and what's different about Sophia? Obviously, you've got a whole lot of, a whole string of other variables to deal with. Um, and so the so what pointing differences are there is it is it just highly slewed mirrors uh i'm sorry uh, motors uh that that need to be in place um can you talk a little bit about the pointing that has to sure. uh, and it's, how it's different? Yeah. it is it is quite a bit more complicated than the ground um because you are in a moving aircraft that is jiggling around as well as flying across the earth's surface the earth is still rotating um, and so you've got a, uh, we've got very, very powerful electric motors that can slew the telescope, uh, at least for short distances, quite rapidly. We can also use our secondary mirror moves even more rapidly, and that can actually um, uh, compensate for the motion. So there's a combination of gyroscopes in the telescope, as well as cameras that we actually use that lock onto the star field. So if the telescope moves a little bit, and if you see the images of the star move, you immediately apply corrections to the position of the telescope and the secondary mirror in the telescope to bring it back so that the, the reality is everything stays, the, the star field stays quite fixed in the, uh, in the instrument itself. So, but, but it's also, I wanted to ask this question since the beginning, but I guess, so you have a door open on a 747 flying uh, 14 kilometers. Is vibration an issue? I mean, how do you take you have to take that out via software, or you know, as part of the the construction itself, must account for that, right? Turbulence right. and so on and so forth. There, there, they, aerodynamically, we did a lot of wind tunnel testing with models here at NASA Ames before we did any before we designed the door. But there is a um, uh, an airflow over that just comes right over the top of that uh, opening, mm -hmm. so that you don't get a lot of turbulence within it. Because if you had a yeah, the plane's flying at over 500 miles an hour. Right. About a 500 mile an hour wind shaking the front end of your telescope violently. So instead, you, we've got a rather smooth laminar airflow that goes over the top of that and then reattaches in a smooth way to the fuselage on the on the aft side of the uh, the aperture. So that in fact, uh, although the there's a strong wind outside the plane, there's not a whole lot of uh, wind inside the telescope cavity. Are there any flight plans that tend to be, or flight paths, I guess I should say, that tend to be used more often? Like, do you tend to go east to west more than you go north south, or is it just doesn't matter? It just depends on what you're it trying to do. It matters actually a lot, um, and it matters that you, uh, what we want to do is be able to see the, uh, the uh, you know, the objects as they're out the side of the airplane. If you actually look at one of our flight plans, and you can actually, anyone that wants to do that, if you, uh, Go on to the uh, the uh, Flight Aware program uh, that you can just oh, yeah. Google Flight Aware. That's tied into all the air traffic control radars. And if you ask for the, rather than a United Airlines flight, if you ask for the flight uh, NASA 747, you will see all of our flight plans. Uh, <laughs> and you can actually watch Sophia fly during a flight. You'll see I, the little airplane go along the path. I'll be doing that. That's awesome. <laughs> Our flight plans look like a squashed bug. Uh, the plane is going zigzagging back and forth, up and down, all around. Uh, as we look at our different targets, the main thing is at the end of the 10 hours, we'd better be over our home airfield again so we can land before we run out of gas. <laughs> so you think a lot of a lot of variables go into play on that one. <laughs> all right, great. Well, um, so the uh, let's get to some of the comments here. Where would you go? Uh, Galaxy is commenting. I want to see Alpha Centauri in the south and the center of our Milky Way as well. And I guess that makes that and that would be cool. I would like to see. Is it possible to 
resolve any of these exoplanets maybe in some of the nearby stars with uh, Sophia? Or is it just not, is it doesn't have the big enough uh, diameter? Well, that, yeah, that's not the specialty of, of Sophia is to do super high angular resolution because it's, it's a two and a half meter telescope, which is non, it's not tiny by any standards, but it's not large enough, nor are any uh, ground-based telescopes uh, large enough to resolve. Uh, resolve planets and get what I imagine you'd really like to see is is what these exoplanets look like. Um, the specialty of Sophia would be doing things like measuring their uh, how hot they are uh, by their infrared emission. Uh, and usually even that, the, the planets are a small fraction of the star. It's extremely challenging and the James Webb Space Telescope will have, uh, will have advantages. We'll be able to make some advances in that field and future, we expect future uh, missions to address that even beyond what's planned for the next, uh, uh, for the next 15 years. Great, okay, well, uh, uh, Harley reminded me of a good thing I wanna bring up right now with uh, uh, outreach and uh, STEM education. Do you guys wanna comment? You guys are pretty uh, active and have a lot of uh, programs or activities and things like that that are involved in outreach. Why don't you give us an overview of some of that? Uh, Tom? Sure, I, well, I can do it, although um, all right, I, I can sort of, we do actually have a program where we actually um, fly uh, school teachers along with us. Uh, NASA did some studies and found that we basically get the biggest bang for our bucks in uh, reaching children in particular by not flying the children themselves, but flying their teachers. <laughs> <They're right. laughs> okay. Because then they because can, they can, they can, they can have a, uh, um, I'm getting some feedback. Getting some feedback. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're, turn your speakers, turn your down, speakers a down a little bit. Maybe your volume. Maybe your volume. Because you're not wearing a headset. You're not wearing a headset. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's switch to Will. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. Just, picking just picking that up. Just picking that up. No, we need oh, to mute. Now I'm getting this. Now I'm getting this. All right. All right. Let's start with Harley. Start with Harley. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, testing, testing. One, yeah, two, it was three. Harley. Yeah, it was Harley. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I love it. I love it. On, oh, man, that's great. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> so, so, Tony, why, put up, can you put up, or, or, one, or, or Alberto, can you put up that slide that says science operations area? I sure can. Yeah. Thanks so much. So, yeah, we fly, uh, we fly educators on a select number of flights per year. We have, it's called the I Airborne... Astronomy Ambassadors Program. Um, oh yeah, thanks, Alberto. Uh, and the reason the reason I asked you to put this slide up is because uh, you see the uh, the guy in the brown flight suit uh, in the front, and he's sitting in front of a console. Uh, right behind him is another console. It's actually just like that one with with monitors, and it's our educators console. So uh, I want to make a point that on the floor in the control room of the observatory, we have dedicated console for the uh, Airborne Ambassadors Program. Uh, typically, we fly two teams of two educators on the uh, on the airborne ambassador flights, uh, and in the past, they've been we've tried to select them from a wide range of uh, of school districts or congressional districts throughout the country. We've had quite a few on board. I don't have the number. Uh, there is a map on uh, on our website that shows where they where they've come from, but they've come from all over the country, and they they typically participate in two flights. So they get to uh, they get to see uh, firsthand what happens. They walk uh, with the headset. Uh, oh yeah, this this must not be a flight because no one's wearing their headsets <laughs> uh, because it's it's pretty loud in there. Stage, you can't commu stage picture or something. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it must it might be a line operation where we're working on things uh, on the ground without the engines on. Um, yeah, with the engines on, it's super loud. Anyway, they walk around on the floor. They get to uh, uh, speak with the people uh, on board. And then the idea is they bring it back to their classrooms. Uh, we have a huge uh, following, thanks to the education program uh, on, on, on their Facebook page. And we hope to continue this education program into the future. Yeah, and, I know, and you got a good Twitter following, too, I noticed as well. So that's really good. The, uh, so what, how does one apply for that? How, do, how, how would a teacher go about being an ambassador if they wanted to? Uh, the rules for that are a little bit in flux now, and I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to try and say now, except that we have a website for this, and uh, and better check back there. Okay, so NASA is it Sophia.nasa.gov, and then just uh, 
look around for a STEM outreach. Let me, I'll try to find the link for you guys and put it in the description box after we're done here. Thanks. Uh, yeah. for places you could go uh, to become an ambassador because it sounds like it's an amazing opportunity for teachers to uh, to get involved and get their students involved in uh, all kinds of really cool astronomy that they're doing here. So, so for, I want to ask you one, one question before we go. Uh, so for for this on the science side, so what is your typical? You said you have a lot of proposals. You have to reject a lot, which is common in uh, you know because we have so many facilities that are oversubscribed. So what is your typical number of proposals you receive over the year, for example, uh, on Sophia? And and you have a number how many you actually reject, so you know the oversubscription over rate. Uh, we expect we'll take about a uh, about a hundred proposals, and our oversubscription is is three and a half to one. Wow. Yeah, so a lot of people do write proposals and end up disappointed, so we try and do it very carefully. And a lot of them are good, a huge fraction of those. Almost all of those are are very are doable. They're above the bar in terms of acceptability, mm -hmm. but we only have a finite amount of time on our resource, course, so we have to turn them down. Yeah. Well, it's always better to be oversubscribed than under, I suppose. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. a good it's a good, uh, good indicator of how important the instrument is. We're running out of time, but I want to get one more question in from Andrew Planet, who's asking a pretty good question. I'd like to know the answer to this myself. And it sounds like the answer might be no, but I'll ask the question first to our panel. Can the separate instruments that can be mounted on Sophia be stored on board so they could be mounted on demand and some other airfield without having to return to the original base? Uh, can they be plug and play at all? And I think I know the answer, but I'll let you guys uh, actually answer it yourself. So what's uh, the yes. one? Thomas? Yeah, they can be. In fact, when we, we go down to New Zealand, uh, we not only have a tele, an instrument attached to the back of the telescope, we've also got at least one in the belly of the airplane in the, uh, in the big cargo areas under there. Uh, when you fly in these commercial airline flights, I don't think we realize Generally, it's only the top half of the airplane that's being used for people. That's right. Yeah, right. With, uh, got all sorts of uh, air freight. So, in fact, um, we do take other instruments along with us. Um, we can also ship them if we need be, um, using a you know nice, careful shipping company to uh, get them to a, a airfield somewhere else and swap them out at a different airfield. Good. So, yeah, no. It, the answer to the question is yes. It can be. We can. Even if we're not swapping them in flight, we can bring some other instruments along with us when we go to a remote deployment. Good question, Andrew. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, that is it for this week. I'm going to stop it now. I want to thank all of you guys for using the deepastronomy.com slash live chat. It, was, it seemed to work really well. I was able to see a lot of really great, really great questions. So thank you guys for using that. Uh, we will be back next week with our Astronomy Coffee with Dr. Carol Christian, where we'll be back next Thursday. We'll be talking about some more cool stuff. So we hope you'll join us there. Uh, but I want to thank our guests, uh, uh, Bill Reach and uh, Tom, uh, uh, Tom Rolick. Rolling. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I need to get better at names if I'm going to do this a little longer. You need another uh, coffee. For joining us on uh, on uh, uh, talking about Sophia. It's been a, an amazing telescope, very extremely uh, unique in terms of what its capabilities are and the way in which it goes about doing astronomy. So I would encourage you guys to look up their science. I will put some links in the description box after we're done here to point you guys to some of the things we talked about on this. Uh, okay, so Harley, I guess the next time we're going to be seeing each other in Alberto will be on our Footsteps to Mars Hangout and the first Thursday of October. Is that correct? Correct. Harley's right. muted, so we're not going to hear from him. Yeah, I know. We got, yeah, we <laughs> Harley has audio <laughs> <laughs> surprise. All right, folks. Well, that's it for this week. I want to thank you on behalf of our guests and Alberto and Harley. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for participating. And we we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And as always, keep looking up. <laughs>